confessing. These are my sins. Bang, 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 bang. Okay? Then at the end of the confession, because I've appointed the priest, the ordinary, as the uh, confessor, I then granted them the right and the power and the authority to then render a sentence under the act of absolution. So the accusation, the confession, the absolution. Three parts to the sacrament of penance. And then, of course, an absolution, the sentence, the satisfaction and the completion of the, of the sacrament. And therefore, any indulgence, which is the salvage, they call it salvation, <laughs> but it's the salvage of sin, is then uh, performed and perfected and can be monetized. So we are talking about strikingly similar procedures here between the sacrament of penance and the administrative procedure of court. Now, the first question is, well, clearly it can't be the sacrament of penance because we don't accuse ourselves, do we? <clears throat> well, well, you'd be wrong because, in fact, you do accuse yourself. All this trickiness about trusts and the appointment of the attorney and uh, guardians and deeming us incompetent and all of this makes the process of the accusation brought before the court a self-accusation and making it work within the parameters of the sacrament of penance. Now, what am I talking about? I mean, you don't make yourself, you don't accuse yourself. The prosecutor accuses you, yes? Well, what do we mean by the prosecutor? And is there any evidence to the truth of what I'm saying? Well, like most of the system, it's hidden in plain sight. In other words, they put it in front of us, right in front of our face, and if we don't see it, then we prove ourselves unworthy. And when it comes to the prosecutor, they couldn't put it more blatant in front of us. Prosecutor is three Latin words, pro, se, cutis. You might know the word cutis, not from being cute, but cuticles. Cutis means skin or flesh. And I hope a number of you understand pro se. So what happens when we say pro se cutis? A pro se cutis means representing one's own flesh or representing the flesh. So the prosecutor, the pro se cutis, in their own title comes to the court claiming to be you, claiming to be you, and makes the accusation. Now, this is prior to any perfection of the trust structure and the prior to any perfection of the judge being appointed executor. We're just talking at this point about the pure ecclesiastical function of what the hell's going on. So the pro acutus makes the accusation as if they are you. Then you're called upon to plea. They trick you into believing that the plea uh, is, is a plea to the court, like a, uh, a pleading, a pledge. In fact, it's an order. It's an agreement. So you're holding the power, absolutely holding the power, until the plea. And when you make the plea, you appoint the judge as the executor. And when you appoint the judge as the executor and you plead not guilty, then the judge effectively is the confessor. You're just the witness. So now the judge can go through and effectively perform the role of the confessor. Now, it's tricky, yes, it's twisted, yes, but understanding the root of what they're doing is fundamental. Now, why do they go to the extent that they go to in this convoluted process? And can we prove, well, can we prove it? I think we're proving it as we go here that the evidence is overwhelming that every single court case is the act of penance. Now, why do they go to this effort? Well... There's several reasons. 
The first is, are they putting you in prison? Are they putting the, the, the penalties on you? Are they the ones that are inflicting the injury on you? Well, no, they're not. You are the one that is agreeing to go to prison. You are the one that's agreeing to lose your home. You are the one that's agreeing to the, the, the punishment that's rendered. Why? Because at the end of the day, under the sacrament of penance, you are the one that made the accusation against yourself, you are the one that confessed, and you are the one that agreed to the sentence. Now, if you didn't understand what was going on, too bad. If you didn't attend a court case or a court hearing and therefore allow the system easily to consider you incompetent and a delinquent, which unfortunately most people still today in the truth movement are saying, don't go to court, don't attend, don't participate, don't give them any credibility. Well, that is the stupidest advice someone can ever tell you because under their system, that just makes the whole thing automated. The only two things you have as an advantage is knowledge and your honour. So if you don't attend court, if you get warrants issued out against you, if you say, I'm not going to go, then at the end of the day, you make it easy for them. Easy, easy for them. So to use their convoluted and contortions to simply say that you have proven yourself unworthy, you've proven yourself to be incompetent, you've proven yourself to be delinquent, and they'll do it anyway. Crazy. Please don't listen to people who make those crazy comments. So, under their system, they are quite happy to keep the sacrament of penance as the base root law, because at the end of the day, we are the ones before God the divine, whatever name you want to ascribe, that condemn ourselves. Now that means they're off the hook spiritually in terms of usurping the law. It means that they've been able to do all their wicked magic for hundreds of years and suffer not a scratch for the evil they've inflicted unless they have a conscience, and some do. But that's why they've been able to get away with it spiritually. And people say, well, why would God... Why would the divine allow such a rabble to be able to continue to corrupt the law? Well, the argument is, the way they've structured it, we're the ones, through our arrogance or through our stupidity, through, through our, our, our lack of understanding the importance of standing in honour, that have allowed it to continue. Now, there's a second reason, a far more basic reason, and it is the reason of money. Money, power, energy. The thing that makes their world run. And it comes down to this. The first time that sin was able to be monetized in their system was the creation of indulgences. And an indulgence is the product of the perfected sacrament of penance. In other words, you cannot perfect an indulgence without having perfected sacrament of penance. So they need the sacrament of penance to work in order to create the indulgence. And what's the indulgence? The indulgence are their bonds. The monetization of sin. Courts are, and they say this, what is court? Cordio. Cordio is a place for bonds, bailments, and securities. The word court it tell, itself tells you that it is a guild factory a place of manufacturing of negotiable instruments, a manufacturing place of indulgences. So this is why. Now, every lawyer, every judge, every prosecutor, every attorney, anyone that has got any experience in the law, many of those people, sadly, if they have not studied this deeply, many will say, this is utter rubbish. That the law and what's going on is statutory and that any kind of remedy is statutory and delving down into this ecclesiastical is just someone taking down a rabbit hole. Well, let me tell you, there are three structures of law happening simultaneously. Three, not one, not two, 
but three. And I'm talking about the root. I'm not denying at all that statutory law, case law, it's also operating at the same time as is trust law at the same time. Three streams of law are operating simultaneously. I'm merely referring to the base of it. Please do not be distracted by people who have not studied this, who do not know this, or feel because of their expertise this is fundamentally wrong. I'm not denying statutory, but the roof of a house exists by the walls of the house that exist by the foundations of the house. The roof does not suspend itself in air. The roof exists because of the walls. The walls exist because of the floor. The floor exists because of the foundations. Let us understand the foundations of their rotten system so that we can address the walls and the roof. Now, the middle layer is the layer of trust law. And the trust is the element and the functioning when we talk about oaths and our word and the conveyance of property and the appointment of people within the court that makes the financial and fiduciary and honourable behaviour in the court correct. So the base may be ecclesiastical, but then the middle is trust. Now, we know as an absolute fact that there is not a court in the world run by the private bar guild where the officials of that court do not know that trust law is operation. They know that trust law is operation, but they refuse to admit it. It's the one thing that they absolutely refuse to admit, and unfortunately it's an area that has had enormous confusion, deliberate or otherwise, in terms of knowing exactly who is who in the zoo. Now, it turns out that in our study of understanding the base of the law that they're operating on, has helped us refine exactly what's going on in trust law. And let's talk about what we know about trust law in a court case. Because the sacrament of penance is yourself accusing yourself, yourself making the confession, and yourself agreeing to the sentence, it turns out under trust law that the only thing that they can presume until we appoint the judge, the executor, is that we are the beneficiary and that the office of executor and any other roles can only be presumed until the point that the executor role has been perfected. In other words, a court case is the creation of a constructive trust. And as it is a constructive trust, there are certain fiduciary duties associated with that trust. Now, what am I talking about when we talk about executor? Let's click on a link, if all of you have gone, or those listening to the call and those who will listen later, onto one-heaven.org, the brown box, How to Succeed in Court. Now, let's have a look at the link that says Executive Office or Executor Office. Now, the link that says Executor Office is giving some background to the role of the Office of Executor, which is some clarity to some of the excitement and discussion that has been on the internet about the Office of Executor and this thing called the Executor Letter. Well, what makes this so exciting? This is why. Because we are the ones that are making the confession and the accusation, as much as the bar would love to appoint themselves the executor, they can't. The, the furthest that they can go is the presumption of incompetence in allowing the pro se cutis, the pro se cutis, to make the accusation as if we have made the accusation. And that is on the principle that we are incompetent, we're under guardianship. That's as far as they can go until we appoint the judge the executor. Now, we are the beneficiary. 
There are no other positions appointed at that point. 